So I will present some works uh, we did uh, fairly recently with uh, the uh, Bruno team, uh, and it's about they are about uh, how to use self-supervised uh, speech models. Let's call them SSL uh, for uh, speaker recognition and, and partly for emotion. Um, let's start by some um, some notes. Uh, until recently, models uh, for extracting uh, speaker uh, representation re uh, representations did not really needed, uh, let's say, uh, la a label training set with respect to the speaker, right? The I vectors um, and the extractor uh, was trained in an, an unsupervised way, right? And um, the first uh, successful application of uh, deep neural networks in speaker recognition uh, was not really, let's build a system to do speaker recognition. It was rather than, rather than that, it was, let's take a speech recognition system Okay, and uh, use it in a way so that it will help us assign frames to phonetic classes, rather than doing it totally unsupervised with a GMM, let's say. Um, of course, that doesn't mean that in order to, to do um, speaker recognition, you didn't need the label data, you needed for training the PLDA backend, as Petr mentioned, right? Uh, but for the main extractor, you didn't need. Uh, and in fact, that was uh, one of the main advantages of these uh, I vectors, uh, let's say, with respect to the predecessor, the joint factor analysis, where you needed uh, many recordings from each speaker in order to use them, to use the speaker in the training set, right? Um, and, but things changed radically with uh, the introduction of uh, DNNs, let's say, speaker discriminative now DNNs. Right, uh, primarily from Johns, Hop uh, Johns Hopkins University, and the CALD implementation was very successful. Uh, so these X vectors uh, were, I mean, provided drastic improvement in the error rates. Uh, but on the other hand, there was no obvious way of uh, using unlabeled recordings. Right, so uh, this was one of the motivations uh, that uh, was behind this approach that um, uh, which probably is one of the first, let's say, approaches to, to um, use something like a self-supervised anyway method uh, for training an extractor, right? And it's inspired a lot by TTS models, right? Uh, that uh, Pet uh, Petra described earlier, right? So assume you have, let's say, a training utterance, an utterance, and uh, you know it's only one speaker there, right? And you can extract two random segments from two to four seconds let's say segment A, segment A and segment B, whatever. And uh, the idea is that you can somehow learn an embedding, okay, from the first segment, okay, that's the, the, lef the left branch, that, and this would be eventually your extractor, right? And you can get this embedding and try to reconstruct the second segment. In order to do, to do that, you need the embedding, okay, and what this person said in this second, let's say, uh, segment. So we implemented that with ASR, so typically it's not self-supervised because we're using ASR model there, right? Uh, but uh, there was no need for speaker labels. If you have, you can add them, and that's what we saw there with a, class with a speaker classifier. You can add them, and um, if you have, let's say, some uh, a, a portion, let's say, of a data set is labeled with the speaker, you can go, go, you can make it a semi-supervised, let's say, learning a model. And um, so this is an encoder-decoder approach, I would say, inspired by TTS systems, right? And uh, there were some interesting follow-ups uh, from uh, Johns Hopkins University uh, that uh, improved in several ways by adding L1 loss also and other ideas. Um, now, with the, the introduction of uh, the, the self-supervised track of uh, Vox SRC that uh, didn't allow uh, the use of, uh, let's say, uh, other models, etc., these uh, methods um, were somehow uh, abandoned, I would say, uh, because, uh, and uh, the, the community tend towards, I would say, methods inspired by computer vision, okay? Uh, and uh, there are a, a bunch of methods that came out of, from, from speaker recognition, but the, from, sorry, from computer vision, uh, were essentially either contrastive or non-contrastive methods 
um, that uh, where you can find, uh, you can train some, let's say, um, um, analogous to embeddings, but for, for ob object recognition and so on. They are contrastive or non-contrastive. Non-contrastive means that you only have uh, pairs, positive pairs, right? In the, in the contrastive, you also need a negative pair. Um, and uh, this, uh, these appear to be quite successful. So a typical, let's say, sorry, a typical um, self-supervised, uh, I'm going backwards, sorry. Uh, yeah, it's this way. So a typical self-supervised now method in speaker recognition goes like that. You first initialize, let's say, your extractor with one of these methods, either contrastive, not contrastive. Now Dino has become, has become very popular. That's the left branch there, you see. And uh, you are clustering it with some k-means or so. You are fixing, let's say, the number of speakers to something that is close to what you believe that they are. So people tend to know that because they're using typically the voxel lab, they know more or less that it's about 6,000, so they fix it right somewhere there. Uh, and uh, then what you're doing is that you are uh, retrain the classifier in a, in a supervised way, essentially, by believing that these are the correct labels. So you're just training some for some epochs, and then you're reclustering, and then you're retraining, and so on. And you do that iteratively. Okay, and uh, this appeared to be quite, uh, this step, the iteratively, the, 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 this iteration appeared to be quite successful. Um, and, uh, yeah, but now, uh, as, you, as you know, there is another, I would say, substantially different category of self-supervised models. Okay, and this is, let's say, the family that is inspired from NLP, right? The, and typically implemented with transformer models, and there are also pre-trained architectures that you can download from Hugging Face, right? And um, for example, Hubert, what, you might know also what to vec 2 Hubert is very standard. I'm going to go through all, all, all of it, but it has some resemblance in the sense that it, it does some sort of iterative train, but in the, in the frame level, okay? Um, and so on. I'm going to go through, uh, uh, through it. I uh, hope you, kn you know more the, the basic concepts, right? Um, and there was also this superb challenge where uh, they're trying to evaluate these pre-trained models um, in several speech-related tasks. Okay, so uh, we went through it and, um, and the idea here is also, let me add, that you are not at least in the main challenge, you're not allowed to fine-tune the, the SSL, okay? It's, it's the SSL and you can add some, maybe fix the, uh, let's say, back-end for this particular task. And uh, so we went through it and we, first of all, some characteristics that uh, they have that are uh, common. Um, say you want to do a task, whatever, you can, and as I mentioned, you have to have, keep the, keep the, let's say, architecture fixed, right? What they are doing is that they are somehow averaging all the layers, because some layers will be more appropriate for other tasks, right? Uh, so they're learning this uh, weight average. This is the gamma there, as you see, which is essentially a vector normalized by a softmax function. And you can learn it end-to-end -end with the, the downstream task. And this layer pooling, I would say, is a reasonable operation, because all these architectures um, have residual connections, right? So doing such an average might not be a sensible thing to do in a, a standard, let's say, neural net. Uh, but in the, if you have residual connection, it makes sense, right? So we went through uh, these um, three tasks, speaker identification, verification, and emotion recognition, all of which are, let's say, utterance level uh, classification tasks. And we, we examine a bit what they're doing. Um, so they have typically a classification head. Um, in ver speaker verification, they also add the TDNN. So they're using essentially the SSL architecture as a feature extractor. And um, they're doing uh, this uh, mean and uh, standard deviation. That's standard things we're doing anyway. Uh, and in motion recognition, also classification head. And we, we said that maybe this is a bit simplicit, too simplistic, I would say, uh, because the problem here is that the SSL models are really frozen, right? And um, they're not obviously trained for speaker recognition or something like that, right? Uh, so 
um, maybe we can do something better than doing some sort of average first or first and second order statistics, right? And we came up with this uh, correlation pooling where um, you are essentially estimating the correlation between these uh, coefficients, right? Um, so this explains nothing more than just evaluating the correlation matrix, right? Um, and uh, yeah, it can be a big matrix, but you first you can drop the number of channels first and do that, and you can have you can then diagonalize it, right? The uh, sorry, vectorize the um, the correlation, and uh, and then add one more linear layer to bring it into a 256, let's say, dimension. Um, so we tried that, and it was uh, quite successful, and. Um, in all three cases, it went really well, especially in the speaker tasks. Um, and we have uh, performance on par with uh, uh, mean uh, STD on, uh, on, on uh, emotion. Um, so the motivation behind that was some ideas, uh, some first approaches of the style transfer. And uh, so the idea was there, I, you are familiar with these concepts, right? You have an image and uh, you have, let's say, the image, uh, it is a realistic image, and you have, let's say, a pen painting, and you want to map it, you, you want to transfer the style, let's say, of this painting to the image. Uh, and do that without really having pairs to train, it, to train this. And the, there are several parallelism you can draw. First of all, they, they start, in order to do that, you're starting with a, tr with a model trained on ImageNet. So to do object recognition, nothing to do with style transfer, right? And uh, in our case, we have a transformer model that is trained on, I would say, something like um, supervised clustering for... for uh, uh, it's, uh, it's self-supervised, but especially Hubert, the, phonetic uni the recognition units are highly correlated with phonetic classes. Okay. But in any case, it's, it's, the model is not training for speaker recognition, right? And uh, there is another parallelism that uh, somehow uh, w they are interested in, in modeling and transferring the style and the texture of uh, the image. We are interested in modeling the speaker and the emotion, okay? Both of which are somehow image or segment level characteristics, right? And uh, so that was the motivation. And, uh, and um, yeah, it appears that uh, it, uh, modeling the correlations helps a lot. Uh, now, can this uh, correlation pooling provide state-of-the-art result if we follow? Because the, the superb challenge is quite limited in the sense that they only we are only allowed to train on Voxel Lab 1. The SSL should be frozen. It's the standard softmax, not the angular matching softmax that Petr uh, explained. Uh, what if we do the if, if we do the full recipe and it appears that it can attain set of the art results and it's either on par or better with the very standard uh, mean and STD pooling if you want to do the full training. So, so if you fine tune, the, even if you want to fine tune the model, uh, the correlation pooling seems to be performing really well. Uh, and we also have an, a, another version because you can say, okay, why not try attention there with correlation? And you can do that. All I, all I change here is just adding this WT, okay, which are essentially attentive weights where you can, they can learn in a standard way, right? And uh, we tried that and um, we did also some label smoothing and uh, we did that only for emotion recognition in this ICASP, uh, we presented the paper and uh, uh, it gave a, a very good boost and these are so far, uh, uh, to the best of our knowledge, the state-of-the-art results in uh, uh, this uh, YAMO cup, which is a very standard data set. Um, and the, the SSL model is frozen, by the way. We are not uh, fine-tuning at all the model. Uh, and still state-of-the-art, yeah. Um, now, I parallel to that, we were working with uh, BUT on another, uh, let's say, way of um, extracting and accumulating information from SSL models. Um, and um, you see, as I mentioned earlier, many propose the use of uh, the state of the art, let's say, model, a cap, a cap at DNN, and use, uh, and essentially replace it, its standard input, which is, let's say, uh, filter banks with SSL features. But we believe that this somehow undermines the real power of 
SSL models, right? Because you're just turning them into a low-level feature extractor. Okay, and probably the ar architecture can, has the capacity to do speaker recognition just by a, a, a better, let's say, pool, pooling mechanism, essentially. And, uh, and in general, it's, it's hard to train uh, this whole architecture and backpropagate gradients, at least for us. We, we, we show that it wasn't that easy thing to do. Uh, so we came up with this, I would say, very straightforward multi-head attention classifier. So here you're using multi-head multi attention for pooling, right? So you need queries, keys, and values. It's pooling, so the queries are just trainable vectors, right? Th think of it like that, okay? And you can have 64 uh, heads like that. Uh, so ideally, we want each head to model, let's say, a phonetic region, but in an unsupervised way, right? Um, so uh, apart from that, the only difference, the, the, uh, the only real d d change, up with that is the following, that theoretically, uh, or not theoretically, um, you should have the keys and the values, right? Now, the values should obviously contain, should obviously contain speaker information, because these are the actual features you put, right? So these should contain, but the keys shouldn't contain speaker information, right? The keys are all, uh, will help you to tell, okay, this, this frame belongs probably to this phonetic class. So you should suppress speaker information there. So we said, okay, why then do something a bit more radical than adding just a, a linear layer and say that we will have a different uh, weight average, uh, average uh, yeah, average pooling across layers. So the keys and the values have a different way of pooling across layers, okay? Uh, and uh, this has a certain similarities, obviously, with uh, the way I mentioned earlier, uh, where DNNs were used in uh, speaker recognition, where you had, let's say, either bottleneck features from a, a, a DNN that is ASR DNN, and uh, these features were helping in order exactly to do that, to assign frames to phonetic classes, right? Uh, so we did that, and. Um, we also did some other bunch of tricks, like um, typically you, you know that we are using this so-called weight decay, which is nothing more than saying I want, I, 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 it's like putting a Gaussian prior with the center of the, me, the, the zero essentially, right? But here you're starting with a pre-trained model. So does it make sense to retain a prior over zero or the prior should be centered somehow to the parameters of your pre-trained model, right? And that's what we're doing, and uh, it can be considered also as a simplified um, a elastic weight consolidation way. It's just that there they have also the Fisher information matrix as covariance. Anyway, so we are adding this loss, and uh, we are also doing this uh, layer-wise learning rate decay. So intuitively, the lower uh, layers shouldn't have, should, let's say, adapt in a smaller rate compared to the higher most, right? And... Uh, and that, that it's quite reasonable. For example, the CNN layers, we don't even adapt them, which are the, the layers that are closer to the data. Um, and with this bunch of tricks, we, we, we can show that um, we can have a real state of the art results without the need of inserting a, a cap at DNN, right? Just with a, a, let's say, pure attentive pooling that's very natural to. Uh, the, the architecture, the transformer architecture, and without introducing uh, convolutions, right? So apart from the, fr the, the, let's say, waveform two frame layer, which is CNN, there are no convolutions after that. Whereas with the, the Kappa DNN, no, obviously there are convolutions, right? And maybe, to me, it's a bit unnatural to have a model that doesn't have at all convolutions, and suddenly in the back end, insert convolutions. It may be a bit unnatural. So, yeah, we show that, yeah, no convolutions are needed. <laughs> uh, another line of research uh, is to try adapters, right? Uh, should we, let's say, uh, fine tune the whole uh, SSL model for its task? Uh, so we tried three different adapters and we experimented with Voxeleb and CNCLEB. Uh, these are, let's say, on the left-hand side, you see the, just the f full fine-tuning. 
And you have the bottleneck adapter where you're setting these, let's say, small fit for neural networks with a bottleneck. Uh, you have also the prefix tuning where it's substantially different. There you are essentially learning some and prepared some frames essentially uh, to the waveform. And you have the combination of this, which is a mix and match adapter. Um, all these are implemented, uh, we implemented, but th uh, there is a nice tool from Hagen Face that you can implement all that extension of the transformers. Uh, and th so these are the results on the uppermost in 1.5 approximately. You see what will happen if you just train the back end and keep the SSL frozen. Uh, the, the, the other horizontal line is uh, what will happen if you do full fine tuning. That's on Voxel Lab. And in between, you see the different adapters and uh, if you play a bit with the size, right? And you see the mix and match doing really well. Um, so, okay, but now the question is okay, uh, but what will happen if you have a small data set as a target? So, CNC Lab, for example. Uh, so, long story, so story short, we found out that what is the better approach, what's the best approach here is to say that, okay, I will fine tune the whole network with Voxeleb, okay, and so that to make it somehow aware of the task, right, and then use adapters to fine tune on, uh, for example, the CNC Lab, which is much better. So, this, this one, this was a better strategy, and I believe it, uh, quite into, it's quite intuitive. Um, yeah, finally we, we experimented a bit with the, the whole pre-trained architecture and said and asked the question, okay, suppose you have the budget and the computational capacity to train from scratch SSL models. Uh, it's time? Yeah, yeah. yeah, okay. What will happen? Uh, is it beneficial to keep it or y you can retrain from scratch? And uh, long story short, uh, if you are dealing with a, tr a model that is just trained on, uh, let's say, Libre Speech, and you have the capacity to retrain it on VoxLM from scratch, do it. It's much better. But always retain the mask LLM uh, style of training. Okay, do not just train it on speaker recognition. Uh, and finally, I'm running out of time, but I just want to point out that there are, in between self-supervised and fully supervised, there are other interesting methods, such as the weekly supervised methods. Okay, for example, what will happen if uh, you don't have, uh, let's say, the luxury of having videos, etc., as the voxel was created. You only have information that uh, somehow a celebrity is somewhere, somewhere talking in this recording. Okay, uh, can, you, can you do something? Can you train from scratch a, a speaker recognition model? And it appears you can, and uh, with just a relative uh, degradation of 15%. Okay, so there are interesting applications somewhere in between the weekly supervised approaches, right? And uh, that's all. Thank you. So earlier there was a slide about equal error rates, and I was sort of surprised at how high they are. Um, I'm wondering if you compare different biometrics, like um, fingerprints and face, ma uh, you know, face recognition, uh, voice prints. Um, what is sort of how do these stack up? If I wanted to build a good lock, you know, what kind of technology works? Um, they are fingerprint is my, it's better. Fingerprint in general is better as far as I'm concerned, but um, and face recognition typically is better, right? So voice is the worst. Yes. Iris, huh? Iris yeah. is the best. Okay. Yeah. All right. Am I right on that? Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with, with this, and also uh, you said the equal rates are high. I, I would say that that. Uh, if they are too low, uh, uh, there is new database, uh, oh. new evaluation, because uh, yeah. it doesn't have more sense to work well, with that. So Jack Godfrey spent a whole lot of time trying to convince people that people aren't very good at this task. Um, so you were saying the machines are better than people, but that's a kind of low bar. Uh, people aren't nearly as good as they think they are. Um, and you know, here you were saying equal error rates of a couple percent. Now maybe it's because the task is defined to be hard, so you can then get something to work on. But 
um, if the, you know, if I want to use this to decide who to put away in prison for the for life, um, I probably don't want equal error rates of a couple percent. Uh, so, 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 so it's true. Uh, uh, the, 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 the machine is uh, better than human, uh, big, uh, but uh, it's uh, about the task definition. Uh, if, if, if you have uh, uh, thousands of uh, unknown people, it, it's very hard to find the, the, the voice you are looking for. Yeah, but if thousands, I care about billions. Yeah. <laughs> if, I, if, if I may add. You need definitely a, a system that is honest with what it really knows. Okay, so a system will, will still be useful uh, to the extent that uh, it's very, very well calibrated, and therefore the probabilistic interpretation is, is indeed valid that you get out of it, like a, a, a log in the form typically of a log likelihood ratio, right? And uh, there is a lot of research towards this direction, yeah. I guess that you want to use voice where you have only voice, and the the, the advantage of voice is that it's it's um, non-invasive. You, you, I mean, you, 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 yeah. And it's well, it's definitely easier than DNA. It's easier than iris. It's uh, you don't if you don't touch anything, you don't get voice prints. But also the the results here, I uh, maybe the best results on Voxelab. What was the Voxelab? Yeah. Uh, well, you. you this is less or maybe 1% on, on uh, this voxel app E and H. And E was, s the data were already selected to be uh, difficult, or maybe the H is uh, d selected to be difficult. So the here they discarded the, the easy trials, and they are really just going for the difficult trials. So maybe you see here a couple of persons, but this is really on the difficult uh, cases. The voxelep, voxelep O and E, voxelep O, I think the lowest was 0.3 percent, voxelep E was 0.5 or something like that. So this is where it is. Maybe it's still too high. I, I don't know. But it, it, it is definitely better than what humans do. And, and when in one of the NIST evals, there was the task where, where the forensic experts <laughs> were supposed to compare uh, recordings and then they were uh, compared with, with, the, with the system which are much, much worse than what we have uh, these days because it was already quite a few years ago and the, the automatic system were much better than the forensic experts that were actually advising judges <laughs> during, during the, <laughs> the, the, the real trials and, and, and they, were, they were claiming that they know how to compare voices but they were much worse than, than the automatic systems. No, so what Lukash is referring to was sometimes called the hazard experiments, the human assistant, sorry human assisted speaker recognition or something like that where basically you're doing speaker recognition using a machine but humans were involved in like you know analyzing and looking and we found that humans just even with the use of some machine help were terrible and the machines by themselves are better but there was an interesting caveat to that it is well known that humans are terrible with unfamiliar voices and that in the human brain, the process, processing of familiar voices of your parents, siblings, just follows different pathways. And while there aren't many objective studies of how good humans are, pretty much everybody can relate to identifying a close friend or relative from just one phrase after not having spoken to them for years, because the processing pathways are different. Uh, also, Ken, I wanted to say that as far as I know, very few uh, jurisdictions allow using voice in actual criminal proceedings. They're mostly investigative tools. So a lot of uh, prosecutors... Yeah, no, no, no. The, the, actually, we, we part, Jack and I discussed some of these things with actual prosecutors and tried to explain to them how it's a good thing if you have somebody in your custody to sort of, you know, say, okay, chances are this guy is telling the truth, so let him go, versus... Chances are it's this guy, let's keep banging on his alibi until it breaks. So they, they use for things like that, but I, at least in the US, I don't know of any court cases where they've been allowed. 
Uh, actually, do Petya, do you know? Do people actually present this in court for anything, or? Uh, so, so, so I, I, I think uh, so in uh, our, our country it is used in courts some uh, time to time, but it is uh, like supporting uh, evidence. It, it is, it can't be the. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in France, actually, it, uh, well, Jean-François is not here today, but he's, o he's often uh, in, in trials uh, in order to give uh, an expert point of view. So the systems are not really used by the, the trials, by the tribunals, but actually the, the experts are. And so they are, they are able, they are, they are, some experts are relying on the ancestral techniques and some other experts are relying on systems and so they have the mission to go explain how the system take the decision, to explain to the jury what is a likelihood ratio, so good luck for them. So, so the machines might be better than people, but people are used in trials and I believe there's quite a bit of history of um, cases that have been reversed because of subsequent technology like DNA and then they go back and do a post-mortem and figure out how the original trial got it wrong. And one of the largest uh, root causes of error is uh, eyewitness testimony. Um, that if you ask a witness to pick somebody out of a lineup, they almost always will find somebody. And the assumption is that there's the guilty person is in the lineup. Uh, they're not very good at reject modeling. Uh, what are you going to do if the guilty person isn't there? And then once they picked them out, their memory's overwritten and they can never get it right again, even if you show them the guilty person. And I think that this is, you know, we could say, what are the witnesses doing? But witnesses could well be using voice and all sorts of things. Um, uh, I think there's quite a bit of evidence that trials do get these things wrong. Um, and now with better technology, we could probably make, you know, even better mistakes. Yeah. Yeah, can, can I ask one technical question? It's uh, regarding the talk by Temos, uh, uh, because um, using the attention head with some non-speaker information for the, the query, it reminds me of an old paper from uh, Nico Schaeffer and uh, Michel McLaren uh, back in 14, 2014, uh, where they, they use this uh, ASR output, and then after you can, uh, but you, in this case, they use the test um, query, actually, in order to estimate the distribution of phonemes on one side and then look at what you have in the well estimate during the enrollment and then during the test you use this in order to uh, smoothen the distribution or to get closer to what you have in the enrollment do you remember this i remember the by, by sri team you mean right yeah, yeah. The sri team the sri uh, introduced the these methods eh, we, we followed with Patrick uh, Kenny yeah, yeah. just a month later, right? But we introduced this idea of uh, uh, using IVEC in, in the iVector machinery, replacing the UBM with a DNN mm -hmm. that is trained for ASR, right? And uh, you can either use the, the, let's say, the posteriors of that or bottleneck features extracted from that. And then Bruno had a lot of. Uh, yeah. University had a lot of papers on that. You are referring to this? Uh, yeah, I mean yeah, but there's an extension of this work in uh -huh. which they use the posteriors from the test uh, during the, the, well, the posterior from the enrollment during the test okay. in order to modify the, well, you have your features going uh, through and then you weight them with the posteriors of uh, extracted by the DNN. I, I remember vaguely this and paper. And they make something yeah. like this. And I think that that could be interesting to put it okay. in the attention mechanism so uh -huh. that you, you combine the knowledge, okay, what the guy pronounced during enrollment, what do we have yeah. here, and can we trust this part of the speech because we don't observe this during the test? And yeah, yeah, I see, what you mean. I see what you mean. Yeah, typically uh, in speaker recognition, we, we want to have, uh, let's say, something that doesn't scale with the trial with a comparison. Mm. So by introducing this kind of stuff, you are uh, introducing mechanisms that scale with the trial. Mm -hmm. And we don't want to have that. That's the, 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 the notion of embeddings were embedded in order to avoid these things. But uh, if, you, if, you, if you want to, if you don't have any, any such a, you know, constraint, whatever time constraint, whatever like that, you can introduce several th things like that. 
But yeah. somehow, somehow it's related to explainability and what the Marie's team is doing. Because if mm -hmm. you have this attention way, it's saying, OK, during enrollment, we saw that. And during test, we didn't observe this uh, phoneme, for instance. And But uh, the system gets confused because somehow the embedding is similar due to some external factor. Then maybe that's a way to say, well, there's, a, there's something that was here during the enrollment and not during the test. So yeah. We, we tend to believe that uh, the embeddings are good in somehow guessing how the pronunciation somehow will be, right, of a, of a speaker, given uh, this, uh, let's say, limited, let's say, number of, uh, of, of uh, phones that, uh, that are that somehow appear in this particular utterance, right? That's a whole concept of uh, I vectors or something. But you can also use the uncertainty, right? Y mm -hmm. You can definitely use the uncertainty of the uh, representations, either I vectors or um, X vectors, okay, and, uh, and build a more, let's say, honest uh, LLR with respect to what you know and what you don't know, mm -hmm. what is based on knowledge and what's based on guessing mm -hmm. somehow, right? Yeah. Are there stupid ways to break these locks, like? Um, you know, when I was at Baidu, I think if I had a if I had your picture, I could break into the building. Just you know, put your picture in front of the camera, and it worked. Um, replay yeah, replay attacks. Um, I gather the way around that is to for the system to come up with a novel phrase you have to say. Um, um, but um, it seems like there must be all kinds of ways around these things besides just the evaluations that we're measuring. How, how do we defend ourselves against that? So, so uh, my opinion uh, is bas basically that, that uh, there are many tasks uh, where the uh, speaker identification is uh, beneficial and uh, the, 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 uh, for example personalization uh, where you have uh, this uh, smart speakers that you have uh, several people in, in, in uh, uh, home and uh, uh, you, you, you need to get personalized answer or, or uh, search in archives. Uh, so so I, I believe that uh, this is the future of uh, speaker identification, and I, I, I think it will be less and less used uh, for for logs. Be, be, because uh, I, I think really uh, sometimes ago it was uh, uh, quite easy to distinguish uh, synthesis and this uh, uh, algorithms, but uh, it is not not anymore, the, the algorithms are more and more complex. Mm 